Hello and welcome to another episode of Analyzing Mormonism. Some of you may be aware that there was a class action lawsuit filed against the church and it was put forth on October 31st, so that was just a few days ago. Anyway, I just felt like reading it out loud and recording myself to make it more accessible for people to understand what's going on in the church right now. Anyway, so this is just me reading the lawsuit. I'm not going to give reaction, I'm just going to read it straight through as best I can. This is my first time reading it through, so, so yeah, anyway, um, I hope you enjoy it. Plaintiffs Daniel Chappelle, Mason Christensen, and John Oakes bring this action for themselves and all others similarly situated against Defendant Corporation of the President of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, COP, and Ensign Peak Advisors, Incorporated, Ensign, collectively defendants. Upon personal knowledge of the facts pertaining to plaintiffs and on information and beliefs as to all other matters, and upon the investigation conducted by plaintiffs' counsel, plaintiffs allege as follows. Preliminary Statement 1. For decades, COP has used false pretenses to obtain donations. Rather than use these funds entrusted to it for charitable work, COP secreted donations away in Enzyme in order to avoid public scrutiny and accountability to the donors, and instead used them for purposes never contemplated by donors and contrary to representatives by COP. 2. A primary source of donated funds obtained by COP are ties, which are traditionally 10% of any income or profits earned each year by members for the missions of COP. In addition to regular tithes, COP also solicits independent donations from members and non-members alike to fund specific charitable work. 3. For instance, COP maintains various philanthropies, including humanitarian relief, which provides immediate emergency assistance to victims of disasters. On its website, COP solicits donations to the humanitarian relief by stating that 100% of every dollar donated is used to help those in need without regard to race, religion, or ethnic origin. 4. Despite these representations to donors, plaintiffs understand, based on public reports from third parties, that COP deliberately hid that some, if not all, of these donations, including both ties and donations made to a COP philanthropy, are permanently invested in accounts it never uses for any charitable work, so that every year, an enormous portion of the donations are never spent for these or any purposes. 5. COP went to extreme lengths to conceal from the public and its members the actual disposition of donations. It created a specific nonprofit entity, Enzyme, to hold and invest the donations. COP had Enzyme egregiously understate the value of its holdings and public filings with the Internal Revenue Services and the Securities and Exchange Commission. This allowed COP to ensure the nature and extent of its assets remained hidden. 6. In December 2019, a whistleblower with exclusive knowledge of the finances of defendants divulged that over the past two decades, COP had funneled billions of dollars of donations into covert permanent investments through Enzyme. 7. In response, COP continued its efforts to conceal its practices, including issuing a statement that it complies with all applicable law governing our donations, investments, taxes, and reserves. 8. In February 2023, the Security and Exchange Commission, SEC, brought charges against Enzyme and COP related to their evasion of public reporting requirements through the use of shell corporations to avoid negative consequences in light of the size of the church's portfolio. As part of a negotiated settlement with the SEC, COP and Enzyme agreed to pay a total of $5 million in civil penalties to settle the charges. 9. Because defendants engage in a scheme to solicit funds from donors for specific purposes, but actually use those funds for different purposes and hid their actual use of funds from donors, plaintiffs are entitled to money damages and injunctive relief under Utah law. 10. Plaintiffs, on behalf of a class of other people who made donations to COP and its charitable arms, now ask the court to determine that COP has breached its fiduciary and other duties it owed donors in its solicitation, collection, use, and disposition of these charitable donations. Defendants continue to misrepresent their use of funds, including concealing their illegal scheme to hide their assets under shell companies, even after the whistleblower first came forward in 2019. Jurisdiction and Venue 11. This court has jurisdiction pursuant to 28 U.S.C. 1332d. Because the class consists of more than 100 members, the amount in controversy exceeds the sum or value of $5 million exclusive of recoverable interest and costs, and a minimal diversity exists. 12. Venue is proper in this district pursuant to 28 U.S.C. 1391. Because defendants are residents of this district, are incorporated in this district, and maintain principal places of business in this district, and because a substantial part of the events and omissions giving rise to the claims of plaintiffs in the class occurred in this district. Parties. 13. Defendant COP is a Utah corporation with its principal place of business at 50 East North Temple, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84150, and may be served with process through its resident agent, Corporation Agent Services, LLC, at 36 State Street, Suite 1900, Salt Lake City, Utah, A4111. The COP is the legal entity behind the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Church. 14. 
COP is the apex organization among the various entities that together operate non-religious businesses and investments on behalf of the church. COP is the owner, operator, and overseer of a significant number of for-profit and non-profit entities, including dozens of office and apartment buildings, four universities, and three media companies. The church has nearly 7 million members in the United States. 15. COP, including its employees, subsidiaries, affiliates, volunteers, and agents, promoted, advertised, provided instruction for, administered, oversaw, and collected donor funds from donors throughout Utah and the United States. 16. Defendant Ensign Peak Advisors Incorporated, Enzyme or Ensign Peak Advisors, is registered as a Utah nonprofit corporation with its principal place of business at 60 East South Temple Street, Suite 400, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84111. It may be served with process through its registered agent, Corporation Agent Services, LLC, at 36 South State Street, Suite 1900, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84111. 17. Ensign discovered by a board of trustees that it is made up of members of COP's presiding bishops and a managing director appointed by the president of COP. The managing director of Ensign reports to senior leadership of COP. 18. Ensign is the entity responsible for managing the donations at issue in this case. 19. Plaintiff Daniel Chappelle is a resident of Virginia. 20. Between January 1, 2013 and today, Mr. Chappelle donated approximately $108,000 to COP. 21. Plaintiff Mason Christensen is a resident of Utah. 22. Between January 1, 2013 and today, Mr. Christensen directly donated approximately $120,000 to COP. 23. In addition, Mr. Christensen has donated approximately $46,000 through donor-advised funds. 24. Mr. Christensen is an active member of the church who made his most recent annual donation to COP on November 11, 2022, and plans to continue making annual donations for the foreseeable future with the understanding the equitable and injunctive relief sought in this litigation is realized. 25. Plaintiff John Oaks is a resident of Utah. 26. Between January 1st and 2013 and today, Mr. Oaks donated approximately $74,000 to COP. 27. Plaintiffs reserve the right to amend this complaint, to name additional party defendants revealed by discovery or further investigation, to have been involved with solicitation, collection, and clandestine investment of donations. Any applicable statutes of limitation are told. 28. Plaintiffs and class members did not discover and could not discover, through the exercise of reasonable diligence, that defendants have been engaged in a scheme to defraud plaintiffs and other donors by soliciting charitable donations, using false and misleading representations, actually directing funds towards unsigned investment portfolio, and engaging in a series of sham transactions and securities law violations in order to obscure the true use of funds from donors and regulatory authorities. 29. Any applicable statutes of limitations have been told by the defendants knowing active and ongoing fraudulent concealment of the facts alleged herein. Defendants knew, or should have known, that while they were soliciting, collecting, and receiving donations, that a significant amount would have been invested instead of being used for charitable purposes as COP represented to members and the public at large. Defendants suppressed this information and affirmatively misrepresented to plaintiffs and class members that they were obeying all applicable laws and that donor funds were not being misdirected for the purpose for which they were solicited. Thus, defendants actively concealed from and failed to notify plaintiffs, class members, and the public for the critical material fact that a significant portion of donations made to COP are not applied to for the purpose for which they were solicited. 30. Defendants were under a continuous fiduciary duty to disclose plaintiffs and class members the true character and nature of the disposition of all donated funds collected, including the critical material facts that a significant portion of donated monies are not used for any religious or charitable purpose, but rather are diverted to non-charitable investments. Plaintiffs and class members reasonably relied on defendants' affirmative representations regarding their use of donated funds and their concealment of the truth about how the funds were used, which rendered their statements misleading. 31. Plaintiffs relied upon and trusted defendants' representations and, to the extent relevant, exercised reasonable diligence but were prevented from uncovering the full extent of defendants' scheme as a result of the defendants' own omission and direct misrepresentation regarding the underlying facts. 32. Under these circumstances, the hardship that enforcing any limitations period would impose on the plaintiffs would outweigh any prejudice to defendants from difficulties of proof caused by the passage of time. 33. As a result, enforcing the limitation period here would be irrational and unjust. 34. Based on the foregoing, defendants are stopped and otherwise unable to rely upon any statutes of limitation or other limitations on the timeline of claims asserted in the defense of this action. Factual Allegations A. Forms of Donation 35. COP asks members to tithe. Members are expected to tithe 10%, 10% of their income and profits. 36. 
COP has publicly, continually, and repeatedly declared in no uncertain terms that tithing funds are always used for charitable purposes. 37. Church members can make tithing donations online through a dedicated website operated by or on behalf of COP. COP also uses tithe slips in its solicitation, collection, and record keeping. The following are examples of two such slips used in recent years. The older version is shown on the left, and a revised version COP introduced in 2012 is on the right. 38. Referring to its tithing slips, COP explains, Donors use this form to itemize their offerings when submitting to a bishopric or priesthood member. 39. Outside of the tithe, COP also directly solicits donations for its charitable arms from the public at large. 40. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Philanthropies, operates as the charitable arm of COP. As the associated website describes, Philanthropies is a department of COP of Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints responsible for felicitating philanthropic donations, not tithing or fast offering, to COP and its affiliated charities. The organization has existed in some form since 1955. In 2018, its name was changed to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Philanthropies. COP states the donations will be used entirely to help the needy. 100% of all donations go to help those in need. No administrative costs are deducted by philanthropies or are affiliated charities. 41. Philanthropies oversee the administration of donations to various charitable projects, including several church-affiliated universities and Latter-day Saint charities, a nonprofit corporation also headquartered in Salt Lake City, Utah. Donations solicited by COP, however, are not restricted to the entity for which they were solicited, but are dispersed across the Baroque web of subsidiary organizations and holding companies, many of which serve no charitable purpose at all. 42. In the portions of its website soliciting donations, COP represents that money donated to humanitarian relief will be spent is used solely on charitable activities. The humanitarian aid portion of the website describes how 100% of every dollar donated is used to help those in need without regard to race, religion, or ethnic origin. This same page continues multiple links to make a gift to humanitarian by donating money. Forty-three. A separate page for philanthropies soliciting donations likewise solicits donations to humanitarian aid with the promise that 100% of every dollar donated is used to help those in need without regard to race, religion, or ethnic origin. Immediately below this promise is another link inviting the reader to make a gift to humanitarian aid. 44. Clicking through this link delivers the reader to a giving page of COP. The top of the giving page, which invites the reader to enter the amount of their donation, again suggests that the purpose of this donation is to relieve suffering, foster self-reliance, and provide opportunities to serve. Relief is provided to people around the globe without regard to race, religious affiliation, or nationality. 45. COP also solicits donations for its missionary fund. In its solicitation page, COP describes the purposes of these donations as to provide needful funding so that all who want to serve a full-time mission may do so. 46. When the reader clicks through the Make a Gift link, they are taken to a payment page. At the top of the page, near the field of entering the donation amount, the page reads, Funds allow thousands of young men and women from all around the globe to have the opportunity to serve a full-time mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who otherwise would not have the financial ability to do so. 47. Recently, COP made some changes in its public solicitation, but without any apparent change to the disposition of the collected funds and without providing any more transparency. 48. These representations are consistent with how COP has represented its work, the work of the philanthropies, and the use to which it would put donated funds for decades. 49. In a 2005 article in the Church News, an official publication of the Church, COP representatives describe why the organization was changing its name from the LDS Foundation to LDS Philanthropies. 50. In the article, representatives from COP explain that donors' gifts are sacred and they are treated as such. 51. The article goes on to paraphrase a statement by Richard C. Edgeley, the first counselor of the presiding bishopric in 2005. 100% of everything that is contributed through LDS Philanthropies goes to the specific purpose it was contributed for. There is zero overhead taken out of the donation for administrative costs. 52. As a result, the article continues, Donations are more accepted from those not of our faith, mostly for the Church's humanitarian efforts. Edgley attributes this to the fact that the Church has a reputation of using funds appropriately and wisely and for the purpose that general populations feel good about. 53. Despite COP's representations to the contrary, 
a substantial and significant amount of the funds it received are not used for humanitarian aid or any other philanthropic or mission-related purpose. Instead, they are distributed to COP, to philanthropies, or to the Corporation of the Presiding Bishopric. Once donated, donor funds are shifted through various church organizations, including between these three entities, to Enzyme and to Enzyme's commingling funds. Fifty-four. Once funds are transferred to Enzyme, they are continually reinvested and never used to fund any church or organization or efforts. B. History of Enzyme Peak Advisors. Fifty-five. In 1997, COP created a nonprofit entity called Enzyme Peak Advisors, Incorporated. Enzyme's Articles of Incorporation specify that it is organized and shall be operated exclusively for religious, educational, and charitable purposes within the meaning of Section 510C3 of the Internal Revenue Code, or benefit, perform the functions of or carry out the purposes of COP. They further specify that its property is irrevocably dedicated to religious, educational, and charitable purposes meeting the requirements for exemption provided by Section 501C3 of the Internal Revenue Code. 56. But, in coordination of COP, in coordination with COP, and contrary to its only reason for existing, Enzyme has never fulfilled its purported mission for COP, nor functioned as a charitable entity. Instead, for more than two decades, it has done only one thing. It has invested donations collected by COP without ever distributing these funds towards any charitable purpose. Boom! 57. In fact, Enzyme has never made a single expenditure for any religious, educational, or charitable objective. And it has no plans to ever spend any of the money it has gathered, instead acting as a massive hedge fund from which no withdrawals are allowed. As the whistleblower report describes it, Enzyme is the reserve of the reserves of COP. COP does not draw down on it, and it has no mission, no liability stream, no schedule of activities, no plans for use, and no efforts to even model the future. Wow. 58. COP deliberately keeps its use of Enzyme shrouded in secrecy. The 100 plus billion dollar corporation has remarkably few employees, 20 people in 2010, and 75 people in 2019. It doesn't even have a sign on the building or in the lobby downstairs. Enzyme employees are siloed from each other, separated by portfolio team. Only four employees, the church, chief investment, and, chief investment officer, chief financial officer, and senior accountant are permitted to see Enzyme's actual financial statements. 59. But COP is taking advantage of Enzyme's nonprofit status to receive billions of dollars in tax breaks on the interest its investments generate even though Enzyme demonstratedly does nothing charitable, religious, or educational. Boom! <laughs> Dang. C. COP repeatedly misrepresents what it does with the donations that end up in Enzyme. 60. By December of 2019, Enzyme has accumulated more than $120 billion from donations to COP or returns on investments of those donations. As the whistleblower report states, Enzyme made zero distributions in the first 12 years of its existence. It has made zero distributions in the past five years. It did have two outflows in 22 years. Neither was planned, and neither went to the furtherance of Enzyme's exempt purpose, nor that of its parent, COP. 61. In 2009, Enzyme spent $600 million to bail out a failing for-profit life insurance company owned by COP. And between 2010 and 2014, Enzyme made a series of payments, again using donated dollars exclusively, for the construction of the City Creek Mall in Salt Lake City, totaling $1.4 billion. Wow. 62. In the lead-up to the construction of the mall, an article in the December 2006 issue of the COP-owned Enzyme magazine stated that no tithing funds would be used for mall construction. 63. An October 5, 2012 article in the Salt Lake Tribune described Keith McMullen, a high-ranking church official who was then leading another COP-affiliated company. Deseret Management Corporation, as stating that not one penny of tithing goes to the church's for-profit endeavors, and also reported that specifically the church has said no tithing went towards City Creek Center. By this time, COP had already made payments from tithing dollars toward building the mall. 64. COP and Enzyme have, in coordination, made additional misleading statements in sworn financial reports to the IRS. As a nonprofit, Enzyme is required only to file an abbreviated financial disclosure using the form 990. On Enzyme's 990 for 2007, its president signed under penalty of perjury that the book value of all assets at the end of the year was $1 million. 65. In actuality, the book value in Enzyme's assets at the time was approximately 38 
$1.5 billion, meaning the declaration made under penalty of perjury reported a figure that was 38,000 times too small. 66. On Enzyme's 990 for 2010, its president signed under penalty of perjury that the book value of all assets at the end of the year was over $1 million. 67. In actuality, the book value of Enzyme's assets at the time was approximately $40 billion, meaning the declaration made under penalty of perjury reported a figure that was 40,000 times too small, unless the handwritten word over was meant to convey to the reader, multiply this number by 40,000 if you would like to know the actual book value of all assets at the end of the year, to which I am swearing under penalty of perjury. <laughs> wow. 68. Thus, COP not only failed to disclose its large-scale hoarding of donated funds, it also, through and in coordination with Enzyme, hid as much information as possible about the purported charitable nonprofit whose investing has yielded more capital than some nations, even by making misrepresentations to the IRS to keep the trove a secret. 69. As part of its efforts to conceal the extent of its holdings from regulators and the public, Enzyme and COP participated in a scheme to hide the extent of its assets from the public because the church was concerned the disclosure of assets in the name of the Enzyme Peak and known church affiliate would lead to negative consequences in light of the size of the church's portfolio. No kidding. 70. Section 13F of the Exchange Act requires institutional investors that control at least 100 million in securities, like Enzyme, to publicly file quarterly public disclosures, with the SEC listing the full market value of the securities that it manages. 71. To evade these reporting requirements, COP and Enzyme, both based in Utah, launched an increasing number of out-of-state shell corporations with church employees, serving on each as purported business managers. By the time the SEC intervened, COP and Enzyme had established 13 shell corporations to hide COP's increasing assets. The full description of COP's illegal scheme to hide its assets from scrutiny by, among others, those who entrusted funds to COP for its mission and charitable work is set forth in the SEC's order instituting cease and desist proceedings pursuant to Section 21C of the Securities and Exchange Act of 1934, making findings and imposing a cease and desist order. 72. Indisputably, by incurring millions of civil fines paid by COP and Enzyme for their orchestrated and illegal deception, the COP and Enzyme wasted these funds and diverted them away from any potential use for the purported charitable mission of COP and Enzyme. D. Plaintiffs donated money to COP because of COP's solicitations and were unaware of the Enzyme investments and deceptions. 73. Plaintiff Chappelle donated approximately $108,000 to the COP over the last 10 years. 74. Based on COP's representations, Plaintiff Chappelle reasonably believed that his donations would be used only for charitable purposes. Because of defendants' ongoing efforts to conceal from the public the nature and extent of the donations held by Enzyme, plaintiff could not appreciate the true manner in which the COP actually intended to and did use his donations. 75. Plaintiff Christensen donated approximately $166,000 to the COP over the last 10 years. 76. Based on COP's representations, plaintiff Christensen reasonably believed that his donations would be used only for charitable purposes. Because of defendants' ongoing efforts to conceal from the public the true nature and extent of the donations held by Enzyme, plaintiff could not appreciate the true manner in which the COP actually intended to and did use his donations. 77. Plaintiff Oaks donated approximately $74,000 to the COP over the last 10 years. 78. Based on COP's representations, plaintiff Oaks reasonably believed that his donations would be used only for charitable purposes. Because of defendants' ongoing efforts to conceal from the public the nature and extent of the donations held by Ensign, plaintiff could not appreciate the true manner in which the COP actually intended to and did use his donations. 79. Plaintiffs did not believe, and had no reason to ever suspect, that COP would take any portion of their donations and invest it into Ensign, where it would sit and accumulate interest in perpetuity and otherwise be using manners antithetical to the purported mission of COP and Enzyme. And even if plaintiffs had any suspicions that COP was engaging in any such practice, they would never have discovered it. 80. Plaintiffs reasonably relied on COP's public statements, including that the vast majority of donated funds were used immediately and that COP complied with all applicable laws. Class Allegations 81. Plaintiffs seek to represent the following class. All persons in the United States donated money to defendants, from January 1, 1998, through the date the class is certified. Excluded from the class are all persons who make a timely election to be excluded, governmental entities, and the judge with whom this case is assigned, and his or her immediate family. 82. 
Plaintiffs reserve the right to revise the class definition based upon information learned through discovery. 83. Certification of plaintiffs' claims for class-wide treatment is appropriate because plaintiffs can prove the elements of their claims on a class-wide basis using the same evidence as would be used to prove those elements in individual actions alleging the same claim. That's cool. 84. Certification of plaintiffs' claims is particularly appropriate as Utah law will apply to the claims of all class members as the claims are asserted in this court sitting in Utah. In addition, defendants are based in Utah and all representations, omissions, concealments, and decisions that provide the basis for the claims asserted in this litigation were conceived of, made, orchestrated, and realized in Utah, which has the most significant relationship to the challenged conduct and the parties. 85. This action has been brought and may be properly maintained on behalf of the class proposed herein under Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 23. A. Numerosity and nature of the notice. 86. Pursuant to Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 23, A1, the members of the class are so numerous and geographically dispersed that individual joinder of all class members is impracticable. While plaintiffs are informed and believe that there are millions of members of the class, the precise number is unknown. Class members may be notified of the pendency of this action by recognized, court-approved notice dissemination methods, which may include U.S. mail, electronic mail, internet postings, and or published note. B. Commonality and predominance. 87. Pursuant to Federal Rules of Civic Procedure 23A2 and 23B3, this action involves common questions of law and fact, which predominate over any questions affecting individual class members, including, without limitation, A. Whether defendants engage in the conduct alleged herein, including misrepresentation of the use of which funds is solicited would be used and the actual use to which it put such funds. B. Whether the conduct of defendants violates the law as asserted herein, including breaches of its duties to plaintiffs and other class members as donors. C. Whether plaintiffs and the other class members are entitled to equitable relief, including but not limited to restitution or injunctive relief. And D. Whether plaintiffs and the other class members are entitled to damages and other monetary relief, and if so, in what amount. C. Typicality. 88. Pursuant to Federal Rule of Civic Procedure 23A3, Plaintiffs' claims are typical for the other class members' claims because, among other things, all class members were comparably injured throughout the wrongful conduct of defendants as described above. D. Adequacy. 89. Pursuant to Federal Rule of Civic Procedure 23A4, plaintiffs are adequate class representatives because their interests did not conflict with the interests of other members of the class they seek to represent. Plaintiffs have retained counsel, competent and experienced in complex class action litigation, and plaintiffs intend to prosecute this action vigorously. The interests of the class will be fairly and adequately protected by plaintiffs and their counsel. E. Declaratory and injunctive relief. 90. Pursuant to Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 23b2, defendants have acted or refused to act on grounds generally applicable to plaintiffs and the other members of the class, thereby making appropriate final injunctive relief and declaratory relief, as described below, with respect to the class as a whole. F. Superiority. 91. Pursuant to Federal Rule of Civic Procedure 23b3, a class action is superior to any other available means for the fair and efficient adjudication of this controversy, and no unusual difficulties are likely to be encountered in the management of this class action. The damages or other financial determinants suffered by the plaintiffs and other class members are relatively small compared to the burden and expense that would be required to individually litigate their claims against defendants, and so it would be impractical for class members to individually seek redress from defendants' wrongful conduct. Even if class members could afford individual litigation, the court system could not. Individualized litigation creates a potential for inconsistent or contradictory judgments and increases the delay and expense to all parties and the court system. By contrast, the class action device presents far fewer management difficulties and provides the benefits of single adjudication, economy of scale, and comprehensive supervision by a single court. Causes of action. First cause of action. Breach of fiduciary duty. 92. Plaintiffs reallege and incorporate by reference all paragraphs as though fully set forth herein. 93. The Utah Charitable Solicitations Act states, Every person soliciting, collecting, or expending contributions for charitable purposes and every officer, director, trustee, or employee of any person concerned with the solicitation, collection, or expenditure of those contributions shall be considered to be a fiduciary and acting in a fiduciary capacity. Utah Code 13 94. The Act defines charitable purposes as any benevolent, educational, philanthropic, humane, patriotic, religious, eleemosynary, 
social welfare, or advocacy, public health, environmental, conservation, civic, or other charitable objective. Utah Code 1322-23. 95. As described in detail in the factual allegations above, COP, including its employees, subsidiaries, affiliates, volunteers, and agents, promoted, advertised, provided instruction for, and administered, oversaw, and collected tithing funds from donors throughout Utah and the United States. 96. At all relevant times, COP was a fiduciary or acting in a fiduciary capacity in connection with its promotion, solicitation, expenditure, and handling of all charitable contributions by class members. It accordingly owed the members of the class all applicable fiduciary duties, including the duty to fully disclose to them all material facts and information in connection with its disposition of the donations. 97. At all relevant times, Ensign was a fiduciary or acting in a fiduciary capacity in connection with its promotion, solicitation, expenditure, and handling of all charitable contributions by class members. Among other things, it acted as a fiduciary in its capacity as the entity that held such funds would make expenditure of donated funds and purportedly use such funds for charitable purposes. It accordingly owed the members of the class all applicable fiduciary duties, including the duty to fully disclose to them all material facts and information in connection with its disposition of all donations. 98. Further, Enzyme aided and abetted in the breach of COP's fiduciary duty to plaintiffs and the class by, among other things, concealing the use of its disposition of funds it received, establishing shell companies and the use of other deceptions to conceal the full extent of the funds it held, and putting funds to uses other than those for which they were solicited. 99. Under the circumstances described in detail above, COP and Enzyme breached its fiduciary duties to plaintiffs and the members of the class by, among other things, misusing the donations, failing to use the donations as represented, failing to fully disclose to the class all material facts and information in connection with their disposition of donated monies, and by continuing to misrepresent their use of donated funds and criminal activity after their scheme was partially disclosed to the public. Wow. 100. As a direct and proximate result of defendants' breach of their fiduciary duties, plaintiff and members of the class donated money to the COP under reasonable but mistaken belief that the funds would be used in the ways that COP represented that they would, that they would be when it solicited donations. 101. However, some portion of these donated funds was actually derived from Enzyme, with no intention of ever being used for the solicited purposes at all, let alone immediately. 102. As a result of the above, plaintiffs and class members suffered damages of an amount to be proven at trial, and are entitled to seek such other relief as may be ordered by the court. Second cause of action, fraud and fraudulent inducement. 103. Plaintiffs reallege and incorporate by reference all paragraphs as though fully set forth herein. 104. In the course of soliciting donations from plaintiffs in the class, defendant COP made false representations regarding contemporaneously existing material facts and made promises of future performance with no contemporaneous intent to perform, including that a. Tithed funds would be directed towards charitable purposes. b. Funds donated to specific church organizations would be directed to those organizations and used exclusively for those purposes. c. The vast majority of donated funds would be used for charitable purposes. and d. COP followed all applicable laws regarding its use of donated funds. 105. These statements and promises were false and are made with no contemporaneous intent to perform. 106. Alongside these statements and promises, COP actively sought to conceal the disposition of donations in concert with Enzyme, including concealment of the amount and status of funds held by Enzyme. 107. Defendant COP knew that these statements were false or recklessly made them without regard to their truth despite substantial evidence to the contrary and furthered its deception by course and concealment of the disposition of the donations. 108. Defendant COP made these statements and undertook its concealment for the purpose of including plaintiffs and class members to donate money to COP. 109. Defendant Enzyme contributed to COP's fraud by accepting donated funds, directing those funds toward non-charitable activities without ever distributing them towards charitable activities, and concealing the extent of COP's holdings. 110. Plaintiffs and class members reasonably relied on these statements, which they believed to be true, and were unaware of the true disposition of the funds. 111. As a result of their reasonable reliance, plaintiffs and class members were induced to donate money to COP. 112. Had plaintiffs and class members known how COP actually used donated funds, they would have either not donated funds or donated lesser amounts. 113. As a result of the above, plaintiffs and class members suffered damages of an amount to be proven at trial and are entitled to seek such other relief as may be ordered by the court. Third cause of action, fraudulent concealment. 114.
Plaintiffs reallege and incorporate by reference all paragraphs as though fully set forth herein. 115. COP intended to provide, and was in the practice of providing funds and solicited from plaintiffs and other class members, to Enzyme for the purpose of holding such funds as such other uses as alleged above. Defendants knew about this and other such material information and had a duty to communicate this information to class members. 116. Yet defendants deliberately concealed from plaintiffs and other class members their intention and practices about the donated funds they received. 117. Specifically, defendant COP concealed the full extent of its holdings and also concealed that it was directing funds to Enzyme for the purpose of investigating for the purpose of investing those funds without ever dispersing them towards charitable activities. 118. Defendant Enzyme contributed to COP's fraud by accepting donated funds, directing those funds towards non-charitable activities without ever dispersing them towards charitable activities, and concealing the extent of COP's holdings. 119. Defendants had a legal duty to disclose the defendants and other class members the disposition of donated funds received, including because they were in a fiduciary relationship and or acting in a fiduciary capacity with class members. 120. COP had a further duty to disclose to plaintiffs and other class members the disposition of donated funds it received because it made full and partial representations that were at odds with its intention and practice with donated funds. 121. Had plaintiffs and class members known how COP actually used donated funds, they would have either not donated funds or donated lesser amounts. 122. As a result of the above, plaintiffs and class members suffered damages of an amount to be proven at trial and are entitled to seek such other relief as may be ordered by the court. Fourth cause of action, unjust enrichment. 123. Plaintiffs reallege and incorporate by reference all paragraphs as though fully set forth herein. 124. As described in detail in the factual allegations above, defendants made material misrepresentations and omissions to plaintiffs and the class in the course of soliciting and use of donations. 125. Specifically, defendant COP misrepresented the full extent of its holdings and also concealed that it was directing funds to Enzyme for the purpose of investing those funds without ever dispersing them towards charitable activities. 126. Defendant Enzyme contributed to COP's fraud by accepting donated funds, directing those funds toward non-charitable activities without ever dispersing them towards charitable activities, and concealing the extent of COP's holdings. 127. Plaintiffs in the class donated money to defendants in reliance to those misrepresentations and omissions. 128. Those donations constituted a benefit conferred on defendants by plaintiffs. 129. Defendants understood the donations to be benefits. 130. Defendants accepted and retained the donated funds despite their knowledge that their statement made to solicit the donations were false and misleading. 131. The continued retention of the donated funds by defendants would be inequitable. 132. As a result, defendants are liable in restitution to plaintiffs and the members of the class to disgorge and remit to plaintiff in class monies contributed in an amount to be proven at trial and subject to the equitable relief that may otherwise be ordered by the court. Request for relief. 133. Because defendants induced plaintiffs and their fellow class members to donate money to COP by misrepresenting how donated funds are and would be spent, they breached their duties to plaintiffs and the class. As described in detail above, plaintiffs individually and on behalf of the members of the class respectfully request that the court enter judgment in their favor and against defendants as follows. A. Certification of the proposed class, including appointment of plaintiffs' counsel as class counsel. B and order temporarily and permanently and joining defendants from continuing the unlawful and deceptive practices alleged in this complaint. C. Injunctive declaratory and other equitable relief, including but not limited to, a declaration that defendants' practices are illegal and a breach of their duties to plaintiffs in the class, an injunction to these illegal practices, an order requiring regular public accounting by defendants as to the collection, use, and disposition of collected funds and interest and income earned from these funds, and the appointment of special master or an equally authorized panel of neutrals to monitor the collection, use, and disposition of collected funds and income earned from these funds. D. Cost, restitution damages, and disgorgement in an amount to be determined at trial. E. An order requiring the defendants to pay both pre- and post-judgment interest on any amounts awarded. F. An award of costs and attorney fees and G. Such other or further relief as may be appropriate. Demand for jury trial. Plaintiffs hereby demand a jury trial for all claims so triable. Dated this 31st day of October 2023. Anyway, thank you for joining me. That was super interesting. I'm really curious to see how this pans out.